fifties, I believe we've lost sight of the value of God's purpose in what a family is, what an extended family is, and their responsibility to one another, particularly to those who are vulnerable in our society. Today, our attention is more about our individual freedoms and rights instead of the personal responsibilities that we have one to another. And so as we go through, there's some important principles that we're going to, at least I hope, understand. The first thing is, there's a command to care. Honour widows who are truly in need. Honour widows who are truly in need. Now when we think of a widow, what comes to mind? An old woman, someone who's lost her husband. That's what we automatically think. In the Greek word, the language used is kara, and it means to be reft of, to be abandoned, or to be left. That's the idea of the word that is here. And it's expressed that any woman who has been left without any means of support, in other words, someone who has no one there to assist or help her. That's the idea behind this uh, word here. Now it does include a woman whose husband has passed away, but it extends and encompasses other women who find themselves in a position of need and have no means of support. Now Paul is emphasizing the need here that the church there at Ephesus needed to express a care and concern for widows who were in these positions of need. Now, today, how do we apply that? Does that apply to us today? Does it apply to us today? And it's hard for us to understand or think that, it, in a sense, how it would apply to us. Because in the modern era, we think, well, that doesn't really apply to us today because we have in our modern society many welfare programs and support groups that are able to reach vulnerable women. That's in our modern society. If we go back to um, ancient times, they didn't have this. Um, women who were widows didn't have access to programs these programs that are available today. And unemployment, well, there was no employment. It was very difficult for them to be able to gain employment. There was no Centrelink they could go to. They could only rely on the help they received from family and friends to get by with. And many, as a result, lived in poverty without any means of financial support. So if you were a widow, in these times, life was pretty difficult and it looked very bleak if you were in this position. And so Paul is saying it's vital that the church took the responsibility to reach out and assist those who are in this position of need. Now the question arises for the church today, like in many uh, issues, we know we're supposed to do these things but what are the guidelines that are there to help us discern between those who are genuinely in this position and those who would like to take us for a ride? Now, it does happen in many cases. Are there guidelines? Should it be just a blanket that we do it for everybody? Well, hang in there with me because we get an answer. Our text should read from the original, widows that are indeed truly widows. That's what it means. Widows who are truly widows, honor them, to ma'o, respect and appreciate them, support them materially. It means to set a price on, it means to assist materially. That's what it means. So in other words, the church is to provide care 
in practical and physical ways for those who are in need. And there's a, a passage in scripture where Jesus' uh, disciples were challenged about not fulfilling their responsibilities. And you'll find it in Matthew chapter 15, 1 through 6. It says, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem. They asked him, Why don't your followers obey the unwritten laws which have been handed down to us? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus answered, And why do you refuse to obey God's command so that you can follow your own teachings? God said, Honor your father and your mother. And anyone who says cruel things to his father or mother must be put to death. But you say a person can tell his father or mother, I have something I could use to help you, but I've given it to God already. You teach that person not to honour his father or his mother. You rejected what God said for the sake of your own rules. So here's a situation where the Pharisees were making a complaint to Jesus about his disciples not obeying the traditions, those things which are handed down from the elders. And... If I summarise this, what did Jesus say to them? In effect, he says, why don't you practise what you preach, you hypocrites? That's what he's saying. But you know, when you look at this, what has been or what had developed over this period of time was something that... Um, it was endorsed, it was implemented by the Pharisees and it was called the Corban Oath. The Corban Oath. Now the Corban Oath is simply this. It's something, let's just say, um, my mum and dad were telling me that I needed to sell something in order to support them. And I didn't want to do that. So I implemented or invoked the Corban Oath. Now the Corban Oath is very sneaky because what it says is, let's just say, I have this Lamborghini that I'm very attached to, that I love to drive, and uh, my parents give me a hard time insisting I sell it so that I can take care of them. So what I do is I implement the core ban oath. In other words, I promised the priest that I would set this Lamborghini aside for the service of God. And because I've done this, my parents have no rights to it and the religious authorities have endorsed that it's something legitimate for me to do. So I choose to implement this core ban oath. Because that means when my parents pass away, I will renounce or revoke this oath and I'm free to get what's rightfully mine. Pretty sneaky, isn't it? But this is what was happening in those days. And the Pharisees, it was a loophole that was given. So if my mum and dad gave me a hard time for not looking after them and they wanted me to sell off stuff, call my oath. I've given, sorry, I'd love to help you, but, you know, I've given it to God. Don't talk to me, talk to God. I've given it to him. I can't help you. But the minute they passed away, revoked, I get it back again. So you can understand what was happening, what children were doing. They were not accepting the responsibility of caring and providing for their parents. So Jesus saw for what it was, and he called it out and told them they were hypocrites by withholding what was necessary for their parents in order to keep it for themselves. So they were guilty of using tradition to get out of supporting their parents. And this was totally inappropriate. They were guilty of not honouring their parents and so they broke the law of God. Then we go on. A charge to confirm, verse 4. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should first learn to fulfill their duty toward their own household and so repay their parents what is owed them for this is what pleases God. A genuine person who qualifies as a real widow is one who's truly alone. 
truly alone. Someone who has no support base to which she could go to receive help or assistance. She was totally alone. No grandchildren, no children, nothing. She's totally alone. This is the criteria of someone who's a genuine uh, person in need. Our text makes it very clear that the primary responsibility for the care and support of the widow is her family, meaning her children and her grandchildren were responsible for looking after her. Paul's instruction to Timothy, he reminds the family, you care for one another, you encourage them, you exhort them. This is learning to practice piety or taking responsibility for those who are related to you and those that you call family. You have a responsibility to look after them. The Bible makes it very clear that a family needs to take care of their own. And we need to take care of those who are widows, who are on their own and have no support or assistance. Our text says we have a debt of love to pay our parents back for all the time, all the effort and money they've invested in our lives that have enabled us to have what we have today. It's as if the Lord is reminding us this is how you show godliness. This is how you show your gratitude in the home by obeying the word of God, by honoring your parents. And the church has a responsibility when there is no support from a physical family and this applies, this principle applies to every person who calls himself a Christian. They have the care and support of his parents and this applies to grandchildren as well. As a son or a grandson, if I have a widowed mum and I have a widowed mum or a grandmother, then it's my responsibility to care and provide for her needs whatever she remains alive. That's my responsibility. There are no outs. If I'm married, this is also my responsibility to provide for my mother-in-law because I'm also part of her family and I have a responsibility. You see, when you get married, it's not just you take a wife, you take a family and you're part of that family and you accept the responsibilities. Now, we're to do this because it's the right and proper thing to do. We're told in our text it's the acceptable thing for God. It's the right thing to do to honor and respect your parents by providing care and support to them when they need it. The Greek word for acceptable is a poveketos, which means it's right. And God thinks the same thing about it as well. This is something that God passionately endorses, that the family takes care of their own. You might be saying and thinking to yourself, well, pastor, you have no idea what my parents are like. I don't know why I should do anything for them. They never really looked after me, and so I feel no obligation to them or for them. Now, that's an attitude I hear quite often. But you, regardless of how you've been treated. Understand one thing, no parent is perfect. All our parents have faults and flaws. And you know what's another revelation? So do we. We're not perfect. We have our flaws as well. Most parents try to be independent. They try to be self-sufficient so they're not a burden on their families. Many of them rarely will seek or ask for help or support. But there's going to come a time when they can't manage to look after themselves. And the older you get, the more that you realise the mind's willing, but you know what? The body just says, uh-uh, no. You know, you get to that time where you sit down and you just sat down and you... Oh, that happens? I'm told that's okay, that's a grandpa nap, that's fine. Or it's a nana nap, that's fine. But you know the body's telling you, you're tired, you need a rest. And it comes a time in your life as you get older where there are things that you used to do, you can't do anymore. 
And often, when children or grandchildren are confronted with parents who can no longer look after themselves, it's a bit of a shock to the system because their parents have always been there for them. Their parents have been the rock of support. They've been around. And so when they see them in this vulnerable position, it's not something that they can adjust to very easily. And this is where the family steps in and it takes care of those people who are in this position simply because it's the right thing to do. Now, that means I cannot hand it off to somebody else. It's my debt of love that I'm to repay for all that my parents have done for me. And this includes me not abdicating my responsibility and say, oh, let the government care for them, I don't care. No, we still have a responsibility to care for them, to support them in many other different ways. So there's a charge to confirm that we have a responsibility and there's a challenge of commitment in verse 5. But the widow, who is truly in need and completely on her own, has set her hope on God and continues in her pleas and prayers night and day. Our text makes it very plain that a real widow is one who has been left alone, who is completely alone, has no husband, no children, no grandchildren. The Greek word used here is monu, and it's the word from which we get mono. Mono means one. It means single. She's on her own. There's no other support there. And it's in the perfect tense and it means to be in a continual state, a permanent condition of being forsaken without any resources. That is a genuine widow, according to our text. And Paul says a person who we find in this condition, do we as a church have a responsibility to her? Our text provides a criteria for this one. It says she trusts in God. She elpizos. Now that's not a swear word. It means she has fixed her hope on God and this is also in the perfect tense. Not only is this woman in a permanent state of being without resources, but she's in a continual condition of presenting herself before God as her only source of hope. She's accepted her situation and her response, her attitude to that situation is she is willing to trust God to provide to meet her needs. This is what she's doing. What Paul is talking about here is a true widow is one who is generally alone, yet she still demonstrates her faith and her godliness depending upon God and God alone. She's not seeking a handout. This tells me very clearly this woman is a Christian and the church has a responsibility to care and provide her as she's part of the community of faith. Now remember I said she's got no support. She's on her own. She has no grandchildren. She has no children. She is a woman of faith who continues to depend on the Lord. The church has a responsibility to help her. And so this is what we are to do. Our text, the woman says, someone who has no care for the Lord, has no care for her, she has fixed her hope on God, she trusts in him, who has promised to care for widows who have no support. And that's something that comes out in the scriptures, that God takes care of widows and orphans, and he does. And so this woman of faith says, I'm going to trust God. I don't know what I can do myself, but I know my God will not let me go. So the point is very clear. The church has a responsibility only to women who are Christians and in this unique situation. Now the church may choose to help non-Christian women, but we are, must help Christian women because they are the part of the household of faith and she is looking to God to supply her needs. In other words, she's a godly woman. She's not looking for a a handout. She's not even going to the church and saying, I need help. She's not looking for anything much from the church. 
She is literally someone that is seeking in prayer the sustenance she needs from the Lord and awaiting the day she goes to be with him. So her faith is in God. Today, tomorrow, the next day. She knows that she's in good hands. That is why the term hope is appropriate here. And it's a wonderful statement about faith. Because this lady has her hope already fixed. She could be old, she could be aging, she may be ill. She knows her days are numbered and that's acceptable to her because her hope has always been fixed upon the person of Jesus Christ, the person of God, the living God who she believes will rescue her from this life. She has a settled conviction about these things and she knows that if she dies tomorrow, then she's glad because she knows where she'll be. She'll be with her God. You'll notice our text says she's a woman of prayer. She continues in entreaties and prayers night and days. Now it's interesting that thought, that expression night and day. To a Jewish person, it was always night and day because the Sabbath began on Friday at sundown. That's when the Sabbath begins and it goes all the way to sundown on Saturday. So it begins at night and it lasts through the day. It suggests she is a woman of great piety. She commits herself to seeking the Lord for all things and she is in prayer to him. It's not to say she's not just praying for herself, but rather it's implying she takes all her concerns to the Lord in prayer. And so what Paul says, the challenge for the church is you commit yourself to meeting her needs. That's the criteria. This is the person who you have a responsibility to meet their needs. Now, in verse 6, there's a contrasting connection. But the one who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. It's an interesting expression. And Paul is making a contrast here about the two types of widows. There's a godly widow who seeks to put her trust in the Lord alone, lives a consistent life. And then he says there's another type of widow who lives for the present moment and isn't relying on God to provide for her needs. Paul makes some strong statements. She is a woman who is dead, even though she's alive. Physically, she's alive, but spiritually, her heart and soul are dead. In other words, this woman who goes out and lives for her own ease and all she wants is looking for her own satisfaction, her own indulgences. She may be living physically, but she's dead inside. Now, these types of women are becoming more frequent in our modern society today. They have no family. They go out and support themselves, but they don't trust God for anything. They don't hope in God for their guidance. They don't depend on God for anything. They have no devotion to him, no love for him, no dependence on him, no desire to obey him. Rather, they live for the moment and for themselves. We're seeing that in our society today. Our society as a whole is turning its back on God. It says, I don't need you, I can look after myself. And they have no thought for God. The Greek word means to live sensually. Some have translated it, it's a very rare verb, spatalo, and it means to lead a life of wanton pleasure. And the wanton means with disregard for what is right. It means to lead a life of pleasure with no thoughts of what is right, or what is wrong, just let it go. Just let yourself go. Or go with the flow. And Paul's instruction to the church is very simple here. He says you're under no obligation, you have no duty, you have no responsibility to provide for a widow who lives a life in this way. This type of widow is allowing herself to plunge into a life of pleasure, a life of comfort. She's self-indulgent, she seeks after pleasure. She lives for the moment and what it brings her. No thoughts about God. She's happy to live a life that definitely isn't defined as being godly. Paul says, you have no responsibility to look after such a woman. Now, 
Um, one commentator that I read said this, this describes a typical unregenerate single woman today who has lost her husband one way or another and she's just out there hopping from one guy to the other, bed to bed, doing her thing, worldly self-indulgence. She's alive physically but dead spiritually. She can make no claim on the church. Now in the context of our text, it's thought that there were some women who existed in the church at Ephesus who while their husbands were alive were actively involved in the church. When the husband died, the widow began to indulge or engage in a different lifestyle and that lifestyle didn't include church or the Christian life. She abandons it altogether. She has no interest in it. The church is under no obligation to support or provide for this type of widow. She is to be allowed to suffer the consequences of her own choice. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. It's not wrong to have nice things, but when they dictate your actions, your attitudes towards life, then it becomes wrong. If you're only living for these things, it's the wrong attitude, it's the wrong response. Paul says, honor and respect the widow who is truly alone, who has no support and is trusting God alone. This type of widow lives to please God. She has a settled conviction about who she is. She has a settled conviction about who her God is and, she is, and where she's going. She is a godly woman. The church should provide and support her. No such obligation exists for the type of widow who lives to enjoy everything this life has to offer without any thought for God or the church. Then there's a confident confirmation. Reinforce these commands so that will not so that they will be on reproach. Paul makes it very clear here that we're to honour and care for those widows who are really widows. And he says to Timothy, you teach, you instruct the church about their duties and responsibilities that they need to be applying so that the church will be blameless in the eyes of the world. Now when the world sees the church doing more than just talking, but actually doing these things, they're shocked, they're amazed, and they get a sense then of what the Christian life is really about, that maybe there's something in this because of the actions and responses of the church to these people. The criticism about the church and against Christians are they do a lot of talking and no action. And this becomes a reflection, really, of what we believe about our God and how we're supposed to live. If we lived up to what we're supposed to do and do it, the world would be transformed by what they see us do. Our message to the world when we care for the widows who are in need is that we're family. We take care of our own. That's the message. This may be difficult sometimes. We care. We love those who are unlovable because if they count themselves among us and if they're part of our church family, God loves them. We need to have the desire to love those that need our care and guidance. And when we show that, we show God's care about his reputation. The world sees that, looks at it, and in it, it sees that we're blameless and above reproach. Now this goes against our culture. Our culture is all about our entitlements, our privileges, our rights. It's not about us looking after our neighbour and loving them as God does. Paul says to Timothy, you have the responsibility, Timothy, to teach these things to all the believers so that Christians will understand how they're to live their lives in such a way that the Lord delights in them. The church's reputation is at stake. How does the world look at us? How do they judge us? What do they see? Do they see a people whose lives are changed or do they see a people who are living just the same way as they are and they see no difference? So the church is to practice what it preaches. 
is to look after the women like this and they will only enhance the church's reputation and remove it from any criticism that may be leveled at the church. And lastly, a cause for concern. But if someone does not provide for his own, especially his own family, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It's pretty strong words. It's a strong statement when you look at it. If you do not look after, if you do not care for those of your own household, especially those who call themselves Christians or who are Christians, who are of the household of faith, then Paul says you're guilty of not taking your responsibilities seriously and are acting worse than an unbeliever would. It's a statement of fact. If you do not pronoeo, provide, meaning if you do not give some consideration to the idea that your parents are getting on and may need your help and support, if you haven't planned to take care of them when they become widows, then Paul says you're worse than a pagan. That's strong stuff. Don't misunderstand what Paul is saying. He is not saying that if you don't take care of parents, then you are a pagan. No, he's not saying that. He's saying that the way you are acting is worse than that of a pagan. An unbeliever is an unbeliever because they choose not to believe. They deny the things of God. But that doesn't mean that all believers don't know how to take care of their parents because many of them do. And they know it's the right thing for them to do and so they do it. His point is this. If an unbeliever knows it's the right thing to do, what does it say about those who belong to the community of faith that they should be more willing to do these things than those of an unbeliever? It speaks volumes about the things we honour. The way we honour God is to care for those in need. This is what he wants us to do. And the unbelievers do not have the same desire or faith, yet they still do the right thing by looking after their parents. Paul basically is saying, shame on you when you don't give a better example than those of the pagans. So that means we have a mandate. We have a model. We have the power to do these things. And if we don't exercise our faith and come up to the same level of a pagan in caring for someone in need, then Paul says we're worse than they are. Why does Paul spend such a large portion of scripture on, if you like, an operational manager, uh, manual about how the church should care for widows? And I believe it's because he wants the church to be above reproach that they might have a reputation that enhances the God that they serve in an acceptable way. Remember, God is the avenger of orphans and widows and we need to be caretakers of them just as he is a caretaker of them. So there's quite a lot in that to digest tonight, but the church has a responsibility, a genuine responsibility for those who are of the household of faith who have nobody to give them assistance. Then the church should be ready, willing and able to do that so it's a challenging thought but there's more to come I've cut it off there but there's more to come